Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce. And of course, here I am with my awesome friend, Emmy, who is getting quite popular. Your Reiki is getting pretty popular, isn't it? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be popular. I want to be helpful. So if it's helpful, both, awesome, but <laughs> you're both you're, uh, I've gotten so many, um, and I'm actually going to pull up, uh, her, her page for you guys. Uh, if you have not subscribed to Emmy yet for her actual YouTube channel, but I have so many people have messaged me, Emmy, to let me know, like how much you've helped them. And, and your healing modality of Reiki. And so I just wanted to give you that shout out. But if you guys want to subscribe to any, Emmy on YouTube, it's Holistic Genie with Emmy. Um, as you can see, she's done quite a few episodes with Stephanie and myself. And she's got all sorts of different videos that, especially if you're on this journey of healing yourself and going doing the inner work, which is the most important thing you can be doing right now. And in fact, in all time, space continuum, it's constantly working on yourself because that's what's going to change everything is if you fix yourself and so her platform is a great place to go if you're looking for that kind of uh those kind of aids and those tools and those tips to to help you on your journey of self-help so i will also be putting obviously um when this video is up on my channel i will be putting down the links to uh emmy's youtube page and i will be putting her email up for you guys who are interested in potentially having some reiki treatments done from emmy and again as i've said to you emmy i've got so many people who have emailed me messaged me just to let me know like how much they benefited from your services so and, and you know the reason why emmy's able to be such so good at her job is because she's constantly working on herself too once you become a a light worker, a healer, whatever it is you call yourself, it doesn't mean that your own work stops. In fact, that's when your own work becomes even more important to work on yourself. And that's kind of what we're going to talk about because you've been doing traditional yoga. Yes. Yes. I've been sore for two and a half weeks straight. <laughs> I, I told you before we started filming, I say this to my students all the time with every course I teach, which where I'm on pause now with my courses because of YouTube. So I'll, I'll let you guys know when I'm finally available to teach a course again. But I always tell them like, I have been sore. I kid you not, I've been sore for 15 years. I'm never not sore. And like this morning, I'm really sore in my left like pectoral muscle. And I don't know why, but I'm really sore here this morning. My inner thighs get sore a lot. And that is something I feel like as Westerners, we're, we're kind of afraid to get uncomfortable, mm. but being uncomfortable is where the magic happens. And so we, we, we zoomed privately a few, like how long ago do we zoom privately to talk about Ashtanga and some, it's about a, about a week ago. Yeah. About a week ago. And I, I, at that time I hadn't been doing any, um, back bends. So I tried, I tried going down the wall and I was actually able to go down a lot farther than what I had anticipated that I could go. And I think that that is because, um, lately, especially the last two, three months, I've really been working on my hips and hip openers because, you know, through my trauma work, I've been doing trauma work for about five years. And, um, going through and reading books and learning the exercises and how yoga ties in and the vagus nerve and everything that has to do with trauma, your hips and your pelvis hold a lot of trauma. And when you do hip openers, you find just how tight you are. And my hip flexors were a mess, an absolute mess. And it makes sense to me now because every time that I would throughout my life, go for a run or a walk or do any kind of other aerobic activity, I would always get so incredibly sore, especially in my, my right side. And it's interesting because now that I know about um, the masculine and feminine sides of the body, I'm able to identify literally almost all of my problems are on my masculine side. And so now I'm beginning to like make the connection there. And it's like, hmm, this is really interesting. So I'm, I want to pick your brain about 
masculine and feminine energies and how that plays into yoga and injuries and different things that have plagued me have all been on my right side. Yeah. And hold on one second, guys. I apologize. It is literally over a hundred deg degrees right now in Atlanta, Georgia, and I need to go turn my fan on. Hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> I hate doing this, but I was like, oh shoot, my fan's not on. Y'all, y'all are gonna start to see us southern girls glisten if I don't have <laughs> so um it's not cute. Yeah, this is what's super, super, super important. And I think that again, the controllers, if we're if we're looking at what's happening at, on a mass global scale, the controllers are not stupid. And they've done a really good job of conditioning us to believe certain uh truths about our physical body that just strictly are not true. And um, soreness is a beautiful thing. Injuries are actually good things too. Like in Ashtanga yoga, we say um, there are three teachers. There's the practice, the teacher, and the injury. And even though we, as, as a teacher, I'm going to do everything I can to avoid that happening for my student. There's no way, there's just no way that someone can have a full career of Ashtanga yoga practicing every day without hitting an injury at some point in their, in their life. And this is very karmic because if you're looking at the postures of yoga, the posture is not hurting you. You're hurting yourself in the posture. And what I mean by that is the body, our body is a living, breathing organism. That is an expression of our soul. Now your soul and its finite uh, existence, the Atman, the Brahman, the Atman, the deeper level of soul is perfect love, unconditional love, perfect energy. However, the body is an expression of that soul to learn that about itself. It's like the eye trying to see itself. So the body becomes the Shakti or the, the, the soul is the Shiva, the body is the Shakti. It's the expression of the soul. So when we look at it that way, when we look at the soul as a living, breathing information highway of, of how we are as a, as a, as a person, we hold all of our karma in our body. And again, I'm going to say this guys, karma is neither good nor bad. It's just action and reaction. It's just cause and effect. It's your work. It's your work. That's all it is. So it's not something to be afraid of. It's just your work. And I know that you guys, we've talked a lot about the chakra system, which I know, um, Emmy is, is very familiar with as a Reiki practitioner. But just for people who are very new to this idea of the chakra system, you can see how we have, and we actually have about 140 chakras in our body, but we really only focus on seven of them that run up the spine. Cause these are like the main vital, like vital organs, we'll call them vital chakras that kind of extend out everywhere. And each one of these, these energy points, and I'm just going to clarify, these are not things that you can see in an x-ray or an mri at least not in third density planets maybe in fourth density we'll see them but not now they're only energetic points all right if you go to your doctor and tell them that you think your chakras are broken they're probably going to send you to a psych ward okay so this is definitely energy you go to people like emmy for that not to your medical doctors and when you start to study the the chakras we see how each one is connected to not just necessarily one idea, but a plethora of different emotions like Muladhara, which is the root chakra is your right to be here on this earth, your right to exist. And of course that gets even deeper, deeper, deeper. And a lot of people have a very wounded root chakra. And of course, if the first chakra is wounded, it's going to cause a domino effect for all of them to be out of place. All right. But I don't want anybody to feel like discouraged by that that's just part of being human you're not going to be human and have perfectly balanced chakras that's just part of being as as emmy says being in this master class called earth right called humaning so but when we start to understand how our our energetic or how our physical body responds to the energetic body we start to understand why certain things are happening in our physical body for example a lot of times people will carry weight where they're wounded right? So people are really overweight in the lower belly area. There's some wounds in the first, second, and third chakra. It's the same thing with being underweight too. You know, on a very basic, basic, basic level, when the heart is broken, when you had a lot of heartache in your life, you do this, mm -hmm. people do this. It's the body closing in around that energy cycle. Those are just basic examples because the details and the complexity of this can get very interesting. 
Um, but when we move, so when we move our body, and I, and I believe the actual principle of yoga, any exercise you can incorporate the mind, uh, the, the yoga to Divrati Naroda, how the mind practices. But with the actual yoga asanas, we are going to be looking at patterning in the body, patterning in the body that's going to create different, that is not an Ashtanga yoga pose, neither is that, um, different uh, by, values, all right? So different values are different paths. So if you look at, for example, let's, let's look at um, primary series of Ashtanga yoga. We are six different series, primary series yoga to Kitsa, which is what Emmy started with. It takes about five, up to five years to learn. Let's look at downward dog, for example. Now, in um, Ashtanga yoga or in traditional yoga, we bring the hands and the feet. As you can see, her hands and her feet are a lot closer than you would maybe would see in a contemporary class. That is for a particular reason. That's to get the serratus anterior muscle to start to activate and also get mola bandha in. See how her belly is very sucked in? That's getting her Uddiyana bandha to activate. Well, here in this posture of downward facing dog, um, this is a variation of a handstand. So with that being said, when you're, when you're in downward dog, you're not, a, this is not a resting posture. This is not a posture you're just hanging out and you're actively pressing into the tips of your fingers, into the palms of your hand. So that you activate a certain type of a chain reaction through the arm that is coming in through the ribs into the bundas out through the heels of the feet. And so there's all these pathways that are starting to open. Well, what happens in the energetic body is if there is like a if there is damage in the hips, which is coming from the first and second chakra, if there's some damage there, some, some trauma there, it's going to be like a car pile up. And so you're going to feel that tension. So you're, you're now starting to open these areas that where there is tension. And so what happens is when you start to open those areas, all those emotions start to come up to the surface because they have to be dealt with. Does that make sense? And so yes. anyway, we'll go ahead. So, so tell me, um, how has the hip opener affected you? We were talking about back bend. So what, mm -hmm. what kind of sensations are you feeling now, Emmy? Well, <clears throat> when I do a lot of hip work and I just want to say that don't let starting yoga intimidate you. Like it has taken me years to get where I am and I'm nowhere near any where near Bryce, <laughs> you're, you're exactly where you're supposed to be. You're, 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 there is, I have a friend, her name's Holly and she has this saying and it goes, um, I am, oh my gosh, now it's escaping me. Darn it. I'm always in the right place at the right time with the right people doing and saying the right things. I love that. So wherever you are, I'm always in the right place at the right time with the right people doing and saying the right things. So wherever you're at, um, when I started my health journey, I weighed 270 pounds. I've lost, I've lost a hundred pounds and I've kept it off for three years. Um, but I had to, I had to join a recovery program because I just could not food addiction was my downfall. I, I stayed away from alcohol, drugs, you know, I, I, I knew that addiction ran on both sides of my family and I wanted to stay away from it, but I wasn't able to, to escape it. Food was my, was my go-to. And <clears throat> so I started my health journey about five years ago and I just wanted to let people know that I'm nowhere near the finish line I'm, and, and neither is Bryce and she's been doing yoga for years, yeah. years and years and years. Just know that you are exactly where you're supposed to be and just begin. Yeah. It's going to be messy. Like I fall over all the time. I lose my balance all the time. And to get back to Bryce's question with the hip openers, um, expect a lot of emotion. I had anxiety for the whole rest of the day. Sometimes a couple days after doing a, a real deep hip session. And the first few times that this was happening, and I didn't know that that's what was happening. I, I thought it was crazy. Like, I think so many people walking around with anxiety and depression, 
and it goes away and comes back and goes away and comes back, they think that they have an imbalance in their brain. And really what is happening is that we just don't understand energy and how it works and how to allow it and how to process it when it comes up. So now when I do hip openers, I expect to have anxiety and, and cry. Like there are stains on my yoga mat from having a, an emotional release, it'll just come up and I'll just start bawling for, I have no idea why, you know, and it, it could be that the trauma I'm releasing is from a pre-verbal or pre-conscious memory phase in my life. Like perhaps in the womb when I was, you know, when my mom was pregnant with me, or like I said, in the pre-verbal phase of our life, if we experience any kind of trauma and we're not able to um, conceptualize that or remember it or bring it to the forefront of our minds, there's no way that you're going to be able to process through that with talk therapy. Yeah. It's not, it's, it's in a part of your brain and in a part of your body that is inaccessible through verbal communication and things like yoga and Reiki and other healing modalities will get to the root of that and bring that stuff up. Um, so <clears throat> It's really important to, to know that emotions are going to be tied in. That, like yoga it just, isn't just an exercise routine. No. It's not just not. for getting into shape with which so many people I know who practice yoga don't really practice yoga. They just no. do it for, for stretching or for, for an it's exercise gonna, routine. Yep. Or, you know, if, you, if you do a proper yoga, proper yoga practice, you're going to get a killer body. Mm -hmm. You're going to have a really nice body. I mean, mm -hmm. you go to the, the room and where I practice the Mysore room in India, where I practice, and it's a room full of muscle. It's a room full of people with six packs. That's just the natural cause and effect of exercise. But if you're not mm -hmm. doing the work presented to you emotionally, then it's just gymnastics. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to say something when you're talking about start now. So the first sutra of the yoga sutras basically says one now the exposition of yoga is being made which is the translation from sanskrit which basically means now now we're starting yoga and you can read this when you first read the the yoga sutras and think okay now i'm a, I'm a beginner i'm this is where i'm going to start but no 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 what patanjali means in this first su sutra is every single day when i step on my yoga mat now the practice of yoga is being made now i start again now I start again. So every day for the last 15 years, six days a week, every day I step on my mat. Now the practice of yoga is now is a new day. I'm and now I'm starting my yoga again because all we have is the present moment. And I wanted to show you guys because I know there's a lot of intimidation when it comes to um, going to yoga classes sometimes. And I was just, we were just talking off camera. Now the thing about it is I'm going to make this very clear too. When you see advertisements on um, Instagram, which we can, I mean, you'll see some on my page. As yoga teachers who run a shala, we have to market to get people into our businesses. And so when you see these, these demos of these postures, usually teachers are only going to put up pictures of postures that they execute really well instead of the ones that they don't. But I guarantee you, everybody has their weakness. Now, in traditional yoga, we practice, I said, the Mysore room and what we call Mysore. And this is basically what Mysore is. I'm going to show this little, this is, this is, that's my teacher. This is where I practice in India. Wow. So this is, so you notice nobody's, there's no leader in the class, right? That's people waiting outside to be called in to take practice. So I'm going to explain this a little bit because Western yoga has taken a completely different um, road it, it completely left traditional yoga. Uh, what, what we see in the Western world is just not at all what you see in India and how, and, and the way they teach it in India is how we, we teach it in traditional shalas here in America, where we teach it Mysore style, which this is a Mysore class. So in traditional yoga, just so you guys understand all these postures and asana, our posture means as, asana means posture, which means uh, a deeper uh, definition is a seat for meditation. All right. So it's so you see this where she's catching here, which, which we you eventually do not on your first day, but eventually you learn how to catch when you open enough to catch. It's not comfortable. 
it's not a comfortable place to be to be catching your so you have to find the meditation while in these uncomfortable postures in fact the whole point of yoga this might rattle some feathers but the whole point of yoga is to get uncomfortable if you're doing postures that are comfortable you're not doing yoga you're doing something else right yes. and and embracing it and mm -hmm. i tell you what when i when i joined my recovery program um, I started telling myself, just get comfortable with being uncomfortable because everything you want is just outside your comfort zone, right? Everything. And so I, I completely look at my yoga practice differently now and I embrace the discomfort and it, it's, it's so liberating in a way. And it, it's such a good teacher. It, pain is such a good teacher. Oh, it, well, that's what I mean. I'll say so this posture right now is an old video. Um, this is the first posture of second series, which is called Pashasana. And you're on you're on your feet, and you have to wrap your arms all the way around your legs, as you see. And we, we made this video to demo the adjustment in Pashasana. But this is literally one of my least favorite postures of all time. But it is the posture that has probably done the most healing for me in my practice. And, and sometimes in, in Ashtanga yoga, traditional yoga, we have these adjustments that we call them cranks. So I'm getting cranked here. They're not in a traditional yoga class. The teacher doesn't come around and rub your shoulders. You know, I used to laugh and say that I would uh, be in downward facing dog and I would see my uh, teacher walking his feet, walking towards me. And I'd get the Jaws theme song in my head. Dun, dun, <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I, knew some, I knew it was like. You know, there was going to be an oh shit moment because it's, uh, you know, and, and in my store room, you hear the F bomb all the time, you know, it's, it's moving and, and that, and what, what's happening though, is in every person's body, we have these set patterns, whether from your parents, whether from you. And so sometimes you can't cr correct your own patterning to an extent, but we all have blind spots. And so we need these, these forces outside of ourselves, which a, a teacher and a good teacher will be able to adjust you in a way to start to open up more pathways within your body. And Pashasana for me, especially got into my ribs, where my ribs were really stuck together and to unstick them and to move that, move that energy. But with Ashtanga Yoga too, with the Mysore, so what, what's happening in this video where you see all these people practicing different things, they're not doing their own stuff. All right, you have there's six different series that come from the Yoga Karanta, which is a papyrus that's been passed down for generations. Primary series is Yoga Chikitsa, and you have second series, nerve therapy, and then A through the rest of them are advanced series. Okay, so when you're working the same practice over and over and over again every day, so if you're doing a different practice every day, I hate to break it to you, but nothing's happening. Because you're not allowing your psyche, you're not allowing your energetic body to move into the alchemy of the posture. Every posture has a certain alchemy to it. And when you just do it one day, you're just skimming the surface. It's like when you take medicine. You wouldn't take medicine for one day. You would take it for a repeated amount of days in order for it to take effect. So with the primary series, now that's what I've started. I mean, it's not primary. There are advanced postures in the primary series. It's only called primary series because it's yoga chikitsa or physical therapy. you got to get your physical body in shape first in order to then tackle nervous system therapy in second series. Now, it's, it's designed to make you stronger. If a uh, primary series, if you are overweight, you will lose a lot of weight. In fact, we have a joke with people when they start practicing. After a few months, they drop a ton of weight. And we call that stronger Like all of a sudden, people get real skinny, you know, from the demands of the practice. And in, a, in traditional yoga, your teacher, you cannot take postures without your teacher giving them to you first. So if your teacher has you going up to the half flat mark of primary series, you can't take the next posture until it's given to you because your teacher is someone who's been doing this a lot longer than you and understands the implications if a posture is given to a student before the student is ready. We're not just looking to see if the student is physically ready. We're looking more importantly to see if the student is emotionally ready and mentally ready for the potency of the posture to come. And so and that's why like in traditional yoga, we don't do teacher trainings. Like if I were to be involved in a yoga alliance teacher training as an authorized teacher, I would lose my authorization. That's how serious they take that. They, they take that as such an offense in India, this, this, these, t these 200 YTT teacher trainings, according to my teachers in India, these are scams. These are all scams. This is why with traditional yoga, not just Ashtanga, but the other, other traditional yogas, you have to go to India 
You have to study for many, many, many years, just like you're in university uh, before actually given permission to teach. They take it very seriously. But with that being said, if you are in the, the MISO room of a traditional yoga teacher, rest assured that teacher knows what they're doing mm-hmm. because they've had their ass handed to them multiple for multiple years themselves. Right. And so, uh, so that's what you're seeing in this room is that you come into the Mysore room. So we practice in Brahma Morta, which is the Vata time of day. So I, I'm up at 2 a.m. when I'm in India, not here in America. In America, I'm up at 4. But at 2 a.m. in India, and you're in the Shala practicing, and you start your practice, and you do your practice on yourself, and the teacher walks around and works with you one-on-one. Because the patterns that you hold as a student are not going to be the same patterns as the person beside you. And so giving a cue to the whole class is not really going to help. They, there needs to be one-on-one attention and you should have one teacher, one teacher, not multiple people's classes you go to, one teacher, because that teacher needs to invest in you and you need to invest in that teacher. The teacher needs to know what you do for a living. They need to know what you're, so they understand your patterning, right? Um, and so uh, and so that's kind of a huge difference between um Between what we see in tradition, I mean, here's in in Ashtanga yoga, we just put our legs behind our head. That's the hip opener we work with. And that is something people see people putting their heads, their legs behind their head and they want it. It's Ekapadashir Shasana. That's this posture right here is Ekapadashir Shasana. It's the second series. And everyone wants to put, they they think it looks so beautiful. They want to be able to put their their leg behind their head. I don't know if they want to make it their match.com profile picture. I don't know. But they want to get that leg behind their head. But... But the minute you start putting your leg behind your head, you talk about some shit coming up. It is all of a sudden these, because that's a deep hip opener. Deep, 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 deep. So the minute you start to put that leg behind the head, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, not only is your body having to change uh, musculature to hold the leg back, it takes a lot of core strength to hold the leg back or else you're like this. But all of a sudden, these emotions start to ride up and into your your awareness. And you're right, Emmy, because I was saying this to somebody else. So, so for example, when a baby is conceived, when the sperm hits the egg, wherever, we'll use sperm as an example, because I know men create sperm and women are born with their eggs. But, but when a sperm hits that egg, whatever vibrational frequency of the man at that time of conception, that vibra- vi- vibrational frequency is now given to the child, right? And so we are born carrying vibrational frequencies from our parents from the time of our conception. Now, at this point, though, once that sperm hits that egg and it becomes an, an autonomous human, that is now that human's, that child's responsibility, to correct that karma. It's not the father's responsibility anymore. It's the child at that point. And we, but, but you're right. You can't have any memories associated to where that came from. You just have to work through the vibrational energy that is given to you. So uh, this stuff is absolutely fascinating. And um, with backbending, you were talking about backbending. The thing about backbends, and I've I've told this to my uh, students before, in all seriousness, in all seriousness, I, when I have a student that comes into my shala, a new student, and they're hypermobile, that freaks me out. I would rather have a student who is super tight and super strong because hypermobility, even though they seem to be kind of loosey goosey and their muscles all are their uh, joints are all buttery. There is usually more issues there than actually the person who is super tight. And I was talking to this with you, uh, Emmy, about the strength portion of yoga, because that's something that's super, even though we have these crazy postures in Ashtanga yoga, we're, we're putting our legs behind our head. We're doing forwards and back handsprings. We're catching our ankles, all that kind of stuff. Even though we have that That's only coming through strength. That's only coming through being able to hold. So this is Pench Myrasana from second series. That's only coming through strength, right? To be able to hold that energy and to be able to move the energy through the body. Um, Have you, I know you told me you've been super sore. So have you experienced that difference in this practice versus what you're doing before? Okay. So the soreness is not, um, it's not debilitating or it doesn't interfere with my daily life. Like, for example, I have done some crazy workouts and injured my knees and my hips as a result. Like, for example, um, insanity. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard of the workout 
um, program called Insanity. Yeah, I have. I was really overweight and I, I was doing that and ended up hurting my knees and my hips because of all the jumping around and um, moving around. And the soreness that you get from overexerting your muscles like that, and, and then you can like barely walk around the next day is, is completely different than the soreness I have from my yoga. It's like, yeah. how do I explain this? Um, like I said, it doesn't interfere with my daily life. Like maybe, um, maybe like when I bend down and, and pick things up or bend over and pick things up, I definitely feel in my, um, backside and down the backs of my legs from doing my downward dog properly now. Um, you know, I'll feel that I'd be like, oof, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's sore, but it's like, it's a good it, sore. It's a good sore. It, it, it doesn't feel bad at all. Um, it, it feels good. Like Bryce was saying, and it, it, I even just doing this two weeks and making the changes that I've done for two and a half weeks, I feel much stronger. In fact, my husband and I, um, we had to, we bought a different couch. And so we had to move our old couch out of the living room and bring the new couch in. And my husband commented, he's like, he's like, wow, he's like, you're a lot stronger than the last time we had to move a piece of furniture. And I was like, oh, really? He's like, yeah, I noticed a huge difference. I'm like, oh, okay. There is nothing that's going to get you stronger than having to lift your own body weight over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. I feel, I know I'm skinnier. I'm, I'm a more Vata in my body. I'm more lanky as uh, my friend, our friend Stephanie says I'm lanky. Um, but I feel like I'm pretty strong because even at my skinniness uh, in my store, I'm able to drop back and stand up 200 pound men just fine. You know, so, but that's from my own practice that I've developed that strength because you are on a very physical level, you are lifting your own body weight. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to find a good backbending picture here so we can talk about backbending because backbending is definitely a, a posture that people will, there's many different backbends. Um, it's definitely something that people will avoid doing is a backbend because backbends can be so freaking triggering for people. And me too. I mean, I, I literally, and I actually think I have the picture somewhere from years ago. I actually, there's a deep back bend in second series. Let me just, I keep having a hard time following, uh, finding it. Uh, it's called Kapotasana. It's a deep, deep back bend in second series. I'm going to share a screen. I'll have to look for my pictures of it. But uh, I actually punched a teacher coming out of Kapotasana once. So this is Kapotasana. Um, and so in order to be in this like horseshoe type of pose, so you're coming into this from your knees. So you're standing up on your knees and you reach back and you catch your, your, your ankles. So that means your legs have to be strong. Your hip flexors have to be mobile and your stomach has to be open. This is Kapotasana B. So you do this five breaths and then you push up to Kapotasana B for five breaths, which I enjoy this a lot better than this. Now, for me, when I first started doing, so doing this every single day, so this is why we do postures every day. When I was given Kapotasana and I smacked, a teacher pulled me into it, and I came out like smack the teacher coming out of it. Um, and he laughed and pulled me back into it again. So, <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, and, and it's no harm, no foul. But, um, but what's happening with back bending is people get so stressed out about the idea of bending your back. Now, the first thing we have to look at is even just in our biological body alone, we have more nerve endings on the front of our body than we do on the back of our body. That is because at some, at some point when our ancestors were, were warring each other and, you know, spears were flying across to different tribes, we had to instinctively know to cover our vital organs. And so there's already just a natural vulnerability when it comes to opening up your, your torso. Now, with that being said, just knowing that, just knowing that is enough for some people to relax into it because they know where that's coming from. And they know that in a Mysore room, in a yoga room, no spear is going to come and attack them, right? And something I had you to work with you on, Emmy, and, and this is what I tell my students too, because I hate backbending. Backbending was it. And because I hated backbending so much, I feel like now I'm a really good backbend teacher because I, I've had to learn. Not, there's nothing as spiritual. Actually, I was speaking with Shanti about this in our last episode with, uh, with Stephanie about the Kundalini. I now get this every time I do this posture, which I do every single day now. Um, 
and I have for years now, there's this burning sensation that I feel it's, it's not like burning, burning. It's good. It comes up from the base of my torso and moves up my spine and I feel it. And that's the baseline of Shishumna of that Kundalini. But what happens in a back bend, and I told you, Emmy, I'm going to see if I could show on this video. I, I'm having you work against the wall instead of pushing up from the floor. So a basic back bend is something called Urdhva Dhanurasana. Let me see what, let me see if I can find that for you guys so you can see Urdhva Dhanurasana. So this is a basic, basic back bend that you see in the, at the end of most of practices, right? You always want to end your practice in back bends. If you start your practice with a back bend, you're going to have, you're going to have a real bad, real bad back bend because you got to be pretty warm to be able to move in that direction. Now in a, that that shit putting the leg in the air that's very much western right and coming to your tiptoes very much western unless you're doing a tiktok so we're looking at urdhva danyarasana so and it's not wheel pose guys that does not translate to wheel pose wheel pose is a pose called chakrasana which is you flipping backwards this is urdhva danyarasana urdhva danyarasana or upward facing bow pose eventually what you're looking for if you think about a bow an archer and a bow is actually creating that curve so eventually the hands are going to catch the ankles and then eventually catch the calves and then eventually catch the thighs. That's the direction you're moving in or that's the trajectory you're moving in. Okay. So like in, and I know in the sweet little Western classes, they have you come out of the back bend, rock your legs around and then push back up again. We don't do that shit. In real yoga. We push up into the back bend, five breaths, come to the top of the head, walk the hands in, push up again come to the top of the head, walk the hands in, push up again and walk in until we catch our ankles. All right. That's not going to happen on your first class though, guys. It's not going to happen. It's just something you're building up for two, for years. Now you also have drop backs. So eventually you will come out of that. You'll stand up from that back bend and then you'll drop back, stand up. So this is kind of what I had you do, Emmy. And this is what I have a lot of students do. I'm not super interested in you pushing up right now because the arms and the strength of the arms, the arms are just really levers in a back bend. They're just levers. What I'm interested in is you opening up your front body, including the front of your hips. A back bend is a stomach opener. All right. And so what a lot of people tend to do because the body is the artful dodger. It will always find the easiest way out of something, especially if the mind is uncomfortable. Let's see if I can show this. I showed this to you and what people try to do in a back bend, instead of pushing their hips forward, they'll try to walk their feet forward like they're doing a limbo. Well, you're not doing a limbo. Your hips need to push forward in order to create that length. So the hips have to come out past the feet in order to create that length in the stomach. If you're not pushing your hips back past your feet, if you're just walking your feet out, you're just, you're not backbending. So that's what I'm having you do, Emmy, is push your, your I'm having you push your hips forward as, not a lot of space back here, guys, and prompt to yoga class. I'm having you lengthen, push your hips forward, and then reach back for the wall, and then start to walk down the wall while pushing your hips forward so that you can create that length that then opens up the stomach. And once the stomach is open, there is, out of all the postures I've ever done, backbending is where you're going to have most of your spiritual experiences, psychedelic spiritual experiences. Nothing's going to open up Manipura like a backbend. Nothing's going to clean your colon out. Sorry to get TMI, but nothing's going to help you regulate your colon like backbending. This is great. This is great. Um, something that happens in Reiki too, that um, I just kind of learned as I went, I, I think it was mentioned in one of my classes, but you just don't remember everything. Right. It's, it's very um, cleansing on a cellular level. Like you, it, it you're going to have more bowel movements. You're going to have to go to the bathroom more. You're going to be sweating, um, yeah. just elimination. And, yeah. you know, I'm finding the same thing with yoga. Now, Bryce, I have a question now. I, because I had so many pregnancies, I've, I've had seven babies and, um, none of them are twins. So with my my fifth baby, when I was pregnant with, excuse me, my sixth, when I was pregnant with my sixth, um, the two halves of my uh, rectus abdominis were 
separated about six inches and my fascial tissue that connected them ended up tearing. Yep. So I wasn't able to um, bring them back together with the exercises that they, they have out there. A lot of them um, for diastasis recti, you can like wrap a sheet around you and, you know, do crunches that way. There's other exercises as well, but I, I was not able to um, get my muscles back to where they were. And then with my seventh pregnancy, the smooth muscle that runs, so your rectus abdominis run like this and your smooth muscle underneath your ab abdominals runs this way. Well, I ended up getting a tear when I was pregnant with my seventh in the smooth muscle and it just opened up like a mouth and I had a hernia about this big yeah. and um, I ended up having to go to a plastic surgeon to have it repaired and pay out of pocket for it because the, the insurance company was only going to pay a general surgeon to put mesh in. And I went to see three general surgeons to get different opinions. And none of them wanted to actually fix the problem, which was reconstruct my muscles. They wanted to put a piece of mesh in there. And they said it would have been the biggest piece of mesh that they ever put in. And that I would probably have to have it replaced every three to five years. So my insurance company was willing to pay for a surgery every three to five years to have this mesh replaced instead of actually fixing the problem. I'm like, no. <laughs> so I, yeah, I, we're out of pocket. What would you, when you, when someone, especially a mom, cause I'm sure we have tons of moms watching us. If you have issues with, um, diastasis recti or you, or you've had surgery, like I have to, to have repair muscles, what, like, what do you, what advice do you have? Like, should, should I be wearing? Cause I have, um, an abdominal brace that I, I put on when I do abdominal um, exercises just so that my muscles have something to push against because I'm sewn up, sewn up like a corset. Yeah. So, so is this that... is actually a lot more common. We have a few female students um, at Ashtang Yoga Atlanta that have these issues that have this issue from childbirth. And um, I would suggest to all of the women watching right now that have had this issue your, and you know this, Emmy, your body it has the, does have the ability to heal itself. However, it might not heal itself at the rate that you want it to heal itself, especially mm -hmm. if there's any type of trauma. I know for women who have had cesarean sections, and I'm not knocking you if you've had cesarean sections, sometimes those are necessary. Like I, my best friend growing up, her mother was tiny and she got stuck in the birth canal and her brother was a cesarean. So there, I'm not saying that that's, you know, that if you had to have a cesarean section, you had to have a cesarean section, right? However, for women who, who have cesarean sections, a lot of times their body doesn't get the, to finish the hormonal process of delivering a baby. And so sometimes in some yoga poses, labor will be triggered again, right? This is just oh, an example. That is, thank you that, very much. My last one was a cesarean section. He, he had his arm up next to his head yep. and over and he couldn't come out. He was stuck yep. and I was in labor for 36 hours. And then we realized that he was stuck. And yep. so, so if they had to cut him out and that, at that point, you had that, that was, that was the best option at that point for you to do what you needed to do and the doctors to do to save both of your lives. Right. So I'm not saying that, that you should not have, like, I want, I want to make that very clear. If you oh, had yeah. to have a cesarean section, like that's what you had to do, but be, be prepared because your body might still be holding onto those hormones because it hasn't finished the process of childbirth. And so sometimes some postures might trigger labor. And if that happens, we have been advised and now I've never had a child. So I've never, but I have had some gnarly cramps. So <laughs> on a very small level, very small level, um, you have to just let it finish so that your body can complete the process. And then you might find some other healing coming from that. However, with what you're speaking about, first of all, if any woman is dealing with that, I would definitely suggest that you find a Mysore style class where you're not following a group in practice. We are working individually with a teacher individually. Find a good teacher. Most of them are pretty well versed in this to work with you at your own pace. You have to tell the teacher about this because we're not mind readers. So you need to let with anything going on like that, you definitely need to tell the teacher so that they know what they're working with, right? Just because you have an injury or something's happened and you're trying to heal it doesn't mean you have to go full, full force at it right? We have to work with what we have. We can't open up. We're trying to create controlled demolition. We're trying to create controlled healing. We're not trying to open up Pandora's box 
and just, you know, get into a shit show, right? Because the body needs to go at a certain, certain pace. And some aspects of your healing, as you probably know from Emmy, some aspects of what you're going through in your healing will happen really fast. Some things you're healing from are going to hold on. They're going to be so stubborn. And you're going to think you work through it and then something's going to happen and it's going to come up again. So I would, first of all, find a Mysore program, find a teacher to work with you and understand that just because you're having these issues doesn't mean you should avoid doing these postures. You're just going to be doing them a little bit differently for a little while. Uh, that's why I'm having you work against the wall, Emmy, and not necessarily worrying about coming from the floor yet. It's because I want you to focus on actually strengthening that area yourself and not because so what tends to happen too, I, I talked about the artful dodger. What tends to happen in everybody, you know, water runs downhill. So wherever we're the weakest, if there's an issue coming from an area and the body doesn't want to work on it, so the or the psyche doesn't because the body's only doing what the psyche tells it to do. So the, the, the mind doesn't want to go there subconsciously or consciously, mm -hmm. then the body will take that energy and push it into another area. And so for you, part of the reason why I'm having you work against the wall is so you're forcing yourself to slowly, like I told Emmy, as she's working against the wall, the biggest thing I want her to work on is pushing her hips forward to extend and contract so she can start to strengthen this particular area of her body. I don't care if her arms go all the way to the floor. I don't care if she just touches the wall. It doesn't go any further than that right now. That's not what matters. It doesn't matter. Listen, li I'm telling you guys, there are a lot of flexible assholes out there. <laughs> For all we know, Ted Bundy could have got his leg behind his head. Like it's not about the, all that movement and that mobi mobility is giving you is ways to create new patterns for you and giving you friction and tension to work with. So with that being said, if you're at the wall and all you can do is just reach back and barely touch the wall. Great. That's where we start. That's still a backbend. It's still a backbend. And as I tell my students all the time, and it's funny, I have a lot of male students. There's a lot of men that practice Ashtanga yoga because it's very masculine practice and they're all straight. They're all, and they always come in at first and they, they like trying to impress me or something. I'm like, listen, listen, I've seen it all. <laughs> I've done it all. I've been farted on. I've, I've spit on. Like there's nothing. If you want to impress me, be a nice person. Like, I don't give a shit what your practice. I really don't care what your practice looks like. What I'm interested in is figuring out what's going on in your, in your, in your psyche. My original teacher, David Grieg used to say that all the time he would have, I would go up to Philadelphia and practice with him. He would have these 22 year old girls who were ex cheerleaders coming in and they could do everything. And he was never really that interested, but he would get a 60 year old man in the room who was overweight and couldn't touch his toes. Oh, he was excited. Because now we have something to work with. Now there's some, so where you feel like there's an issue, like with your stomach or if someone's feeling like, oh, I've got issues with this. Perfect. Now we have something to work with. This is what makes it interesting. This is what make this is where the juice is. This is where the potency is, is where is, where is that tension? Where is, it's like, I told you guys, backbending has always been a struggle for me. I smacked a teacher coming out of a backbend, but that's where I knew I had, I could find the golden egg because so that's where there was the most resistance right it is i'm going to be honest with you the way my body is the way my pattern is forward folding is super easy for me putting my leg behind my head i could sit like that all day that was never a challenge but again back bending huge challenge for me but that's where i found the most healing and the most clarity that's where i've had the most experiences within my own internal work on my mat is through the, the different variations of back bends. Strengthening wasn't hard for me, you know, but that might be different for someone else. Someone else might be really good at back bending, but struggle with leg behind the head. And so that's where they find their juice. So just because something is a struggle, just because there's an obstacle doesn't mean you should run from it. In fact, because there's an obstacle, that should be where you are the most excited to work because that's where you're going to find the real, real juicy stuff right? It's like Ganesh, the, the Ganesha of, of the Hinduism. He's the remover of obstacles. People always say, oh, Ganesha is the remover of obstacles, but he's also the bringer of obstacles. He also brings obstacles because their obstacles are necessary. They're necessary for growth, right? And, um, and so like when, again, I found, I went back to my Instagram to use me as an example. So I'm not just pulling up random people on the internet. So I don't know if you can see, this is Urdhva Danyarasa, or excuse me, um, 
uh, Ustrasana and where my head's back, I'm catching. So my hips are coming forward here in that posture, right? You can, I don't know if you guys can see that this is an advertising picture, but my hips are coming forward in this posture. They're coming forward. Um, see if I can, Oh, you know, here's a video of my friend teaching somebody a back bend. This is a, one thing we do a lot with students and having them hold my friend, Mark up in Ohio. Hey, Mark, if you're watching, he rescues dogs with me in India. So you see how he's walking even and getting closer to try to sharpen. He's pushing his sits forward and walking his feet closer to sharpen the back bend here, but his hips are going to come forward more. See? And then he's probably going to stand up if I can remember correctly. So that's something you can do with your teacher is walk up their legs. I do this with students all the time. I have them walk up my legs. This is why I shave my legs every day. <laughs> It's because people are often using my legs as their as their prop. That's his wife, by the way. He's holding his wife's legs right now, um, right? And so now he's learning how to stand up, right? So you can do that with students. That's a way to to help them work on that. Um, it's it's uh, see if I have any more stuff here. So here's David Greig. You know, that's my working with me taking pictures for a workshop demonstration. Or I'm on blocks and see he's pushing my hips forward holding my knees down so that my hips push forward so that the, the, the momentum is coming from this area. And let's talk about this area for a moment, because in a lot of cultures, a lot of cultures, this area is very taboo. We've been conditioned to think that that is taboo, right? And so then we come into a yoga program and now we're told to not only work with that, but actually live in that area. But that lower base, I'm going to see if we have any more from Miami. If we, if we have any more, uh, if I have any more of the pictures from uh, backbending. So, uh, oh, here's, uh, this is from second series. This is uh, a backbend that is actually a counter pose. And you can kind of see here, you always have to have help with this posture. You have to wait for the teacher to come help you. The way that the posture is going to open, uh, Supta Vajrasana is going to open up uh, the back. waiting for a teacher to come here um, because the stomach. Yeah. And that release, it's funny. We always laugh and say in Ashtanga yoga, only people, we can only hang out with other Ashtanga people. Cause we always talk about periods and we always take about, talk about your colon. So other people, <laughs> you see how my, he's using my arms crossed behind my back is a way to, to open the chest up and that, yes, that is sweat guys. You're supposed to sweat. Sweat is a very important part. Oh, of yeah. Practice. That's another thing. That's another thing since I've been made those changes and doing yoga correctly or started to do yoga correctly. I am absolutely breathless and sweaty. Good. That's top of like, heat. Yeah. Like within minutes. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, same with me. I, I sweat like a 300 print. Well, actually the fitter you are, the more in touch with your, the more your body is, is in touch with that. Uh, the more you sweat. Um, and I sweat like a 300 pound man with gland problems. Um, and this is something I gave you to do too. I do this every morning. I, I stretch open my hip flexors before I start my practice, which is right here. I push forward to get that sizzling sensation in my hip just to start to open it because that's where a lot of that mo momentum is. So your hips aren't just that joint. It's also the front of your hip and the back of your hip, which is your, your gluteus as well. So it's that whole, and that's the biggest joint you have in your body. It's kind of like that junk drawer, right? So like anytime you don't know what to do with something, you just shove, you just shove it down into that junk drawer and then it's got to come up. Um, you know, so there's, there's a, let's see if there's any other, I, I obviously don't like, don't like taking backbending pictures. Um, so, okay, let's talk about chaturanga. That's one thing for women that they struggle with. And guys, if you are new to yoga, especially if you're a lady, ladies, Ladies, some men too. Ladies, our body is a pranic. We are the moon. Men are pranic. They're the sun. What does that mean biologically? It means that our upper body is weaker than our lower body. Women are have really strong legs. So we, again, have the propensity. This is what I was having you work with, uh, with, with doing when, when women try to do chaturanga and they're not strong enough for chaturanga, they do this thing with their shoulders with a roll forward. So my shoulders are in their socket right here. That's a pretty strong chaturanga. My legs are engaged, my core is engaged, and my shoulders are in their socket. I see women do what I call the chaturanga seizure, where they start to lower down and their shoulders come forward, their butt comes up, and it's because they're not, they don't know how to hold their weight yet. And so that, that weight is running downhill. It's running into the joint socket. 
All right. And that's going to push the joint out of joint, right? Thousand times. Okay. Thousand one times. Not okay. Then there's an injury. So what I have women do, I told, I told this to you, Emmy is don't you dare drop to your knees in Chaturanga. <laughs> Dropping to your knees in Chaturanga means that you are releasing your hamstrings. If you release your hamstrings, you're going to start to release your core. Bad news bears, you're not going to get stronger. What you need to do is stay in a plank position. So stay in a plank position until you're slowly able to lower. And you build up that strength. And what we're doing is we're looking at protraction and retraction. And I had, I talked to Emmy about this and I actually brought, so I have, I have one lowly block here because we don't use a lot of props in Ashtanga Yoga, which my dog has chewed up. So you can use a, a, a block or you can use a ball. I have a little recess ball here and you can just hold an object, sit in front of your mirror and you can look at protraction, retraction, protraction, retract, retraction. When you're retracted, that means you're weak. That means you're, you're sinking down right? When you're protracted, when you're protracted, that means you're active. So in like downward facing dog, you should be protracted because you're controlling that energy. You should never, and that's the same thing in the, in the postures too. So like if you're in a forward fold, if you're in Paschimottanasana or something and you're forward folded, your feet should not just be hanging out. They should be actively pressing. The heel should be active because that's what's moving the energy guys your muscles is what are is what's moving the energy so if you passively stretch and relax into a posture nothing's happening you got to right. turn activate that's why sweat is important that's why you're sweating it's because you're actively stretching you're actively taking so here i don't know if i can right so if you're if you're in paschimottanasana your your heel should be totally extended out like that because that's keeping all the muscles active up the leg. If you're in this posture and you're like kind of relaxed like that, like nothing's happening, right? And that's also going to probably bring you to a place of injury as well. You're you're less likely to injure yourself when you're actively in that posture, right? So um, that's another thing. But again, but most importantly, that's what's moving energy. Yes. Yeah, the... The, the muscle activation, especially with downward dog, downward dog is probably one of my favorite poses. And when I see it, the funny thing is Bryce gave me those exercises with the protraction and retraction. And my chiropractor had given me the same exercises. And I just didn't put the two and two together. I, I just, but once I started doing that with my yoga, um, immediately breathless and immediately yeah. sweaty. Like I, I was definitely retracted in my shoulders and almost every single pose. And yeah. And that's the thing. A thousand, you'll do that a thousand times and you won't notice anything. You do it a thousand one times and you're injured and you're injured. I mean, even in like other postures, like this is a, like not like when you're just doing a forward fold, like I'm still active here. This is in India. I'm still active. My legs are still active, right? There's still activation. Even in Marichasana D, there's still activation. You have to be active in order to, why are you going to, listen, Ashtanga yoga is super hard. Why are you going to do traditional yoga and then not activate yourself, not act and not, not do something to, to, to make it worth it? Because there are other exercises you can do if you're just looking you know, to have a good body, this is actually working your energetic body. This is actually presenting things to you that need to be clean, cleared out, cleaned, whatever, you know? So, um, so yeah, you, you, you must be active. You must be sweaty. If you're not sweating, you're not moving energy, right? That heat, that, that detoxification, that boiling of the blood in order to move all the toxins out of your system. That's what you're doing. You know, you, you should not, you should, your body should be changing. You should see the changes in your body from your practice. You should see muscle development. You should see that kind of stuff as a result of what's happening because you are actively using your body. And so that is, that is something that is super important, super, super, super important. I know that, uh, Emmy has, has found a lot of benefit from that, um, let's see here. There's something else here. Yeah. So you should absolutely be sweating. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That's, uh, that was when we were in England one time and that's when, when, that's when people first started taking selfies and I tried to take a selfie and it just, 
<laughs> so, um, so anyway, yeah, it's, it's all about making the body as pliable and as mobile as possible for you in order to get your energy to start to move in order for you to clear out your own karma. Oh, here's the picture. It was right after this that I smacked the teacher in the face. <laughs> That's Tim Feldman. And I literally came out and smacked him in the face. That was so many years ago. But, um, but yeah, you know, you, you should be a little bit sore. You, your body should be, um, have I talked to you about, do you guys do oil baths in, uh, and Reiki, Emmy? Um, no, I do. I do oil baths on my, on myself, but it wasn't part of my, the classes that I have taken for Reiki. So this is oil bathing. Those are, those are my legs and a, and a much younger many years ago. Oh, uh, well, 2015. Oh yeah. Seven years ago. Um, so oil bathing is super, is super, um, good for people who do Ashtanga yoga or do a lot of um, work on their own bodies. You, you cover your body in castor oil. I usually do it the night before my rest day because it, you sleep really hard after you do it. And you, I sit for like 90 minutes with castor oil in my body, but I've been doing it for a really long time. If you're new to castor oil bathing, I would only do it for like 10 minutes. You sit with it on your body and then you wash it off and it pulls out a lot of the inflammation from the body. Uh, because you will, you will still have some, you know, you're, you're exercising. So there is still going to be some inflammation that's happening um, within your body when you're, when you're doing uh, any type of exercise, whether it's for spirituality or just basic exercise. So, um, so yeah. And you can see, so if you incorporate something like Ashtanga yoga and Reiki, like how much more beneficial would a Reiki session be to someone if they're already doing something that's that they are moving their energy for themselves and they come to a Reiki practitioner, would that be more beneficial for that, that's that client? I, I would think so because you're, you're already, um, somewhat in tune with your trauma and your karma, and you're already working with your energy and moving it. One thing that I notice with, um, a lot of my clients is the lower chakras are just a hot mess. There are so many people who hang out up here yep. because there's so much trauma and toxicity in the body that your soul can't completely descend down into your lower chakras. So you're just kind of hanging out up here. And it, it's just, I lived, I know this because I lived up in my upper chakras my entire life. I was constantly, I'd have people telling me, <laughs> thank you, honey. <laughs> um, I'll have, I'll have people telling me when I was growing up, uh, Earth to Emmy, Space Cadet, like I just was constantly somewhere else, just completely somewhere else. And I didn't realize that that was because I had so much trauma and toxicity in my body that it was just not an environment for my spirit to enter. Okay, William wants to show everybody this piece of bark that he found at the park today and he thought it smelled really really nice he's super connected to mother earth so he went he wanted to show everybody. that is awesome William <laughs> thank you for showing us that's awesome yeah I've noticed that too a lot especially with people in this great which is great that in this great awakening people are discovering spirituality but they leap up into this idea of it being so like so like in the in the sky like in the sky and true and that's why i keep saying like guys tarot card reading channeling all that kind of stuff that's actually not spirituality it's just channeling we all have the clairs we all have the ability to channel it's just a communication true spirituality is getting into yourself as magdalene says it's descending into yourself it's looking at the hu it's fixing the human side of you you know you're a spiritual being having a human experience yes but you're a spiritual being who decided to have a human experience for a particular reason. And so you can't negate the human. It's just like um, if you want to get through a, a forest, if the forest is your trauma, you can't get to the other side by going around the forest. You have to go through it. You know, yeah. this way the lotus flower is, is huge in the yoga world because the lotus flower grows on top of the muck and the mud. Mm -hmm. It has to come through. It has to come through the mud to blossom and, 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 you know, it's amazing. The lotus flower does not get any mud on any of its petals. It's completely and totally closed up as it's coming through 
the mock like, yeah. And it opens. Yeah. That's I why saw we, one the other day. It was so beautiful. That's why it's used in yoga as like the symbol of yoga. It's like, but that's you, you're the lotus flower and you have to go through that mud, but your soul is beautiful. And so it's going to go through it and then it's going to bloom. And I struggled a lot when I first started, like I had a real hard time getting down into my second and my first and second chakra. Like, I like had a real hard time because I had grown up in the deep South in this not necessarily purity culture coming through my parents because yes the deep south, south is the bible belt my parents were conservative christian but they were more southern than anything and so a lady sat with her legs crossed you know all that pressure around women about you getting pregnant all that kind of stuff and so i realized that i had a lot of i also had some other stuff going on which we won't talk about on youtube but there was some trauma there that i had absolutely had to work through i absolutely had to get in touch with in order to he find a, d a deeper layer of myself. And since doing that, I am so I'm actually one of the benefits is I'm so much more confident about my own sexuality. I'm so much more confident because I worked through all that trauma I worked through. And I'm going to show you guys this. I'll put a link down in the description box below for those who are starting to understand the chakra system, Eastern body, Western mind. This is um, a great book to start with uh it, where she goes through every chakra the traumas the imbalances balances your chakras never shut down it's either spinning too fast or too slow depending on some chakras are overactive and i will say too like with the with the back bends like kapotasana the deep heart opening with that particular posture i went through a period of time with where every day after every day in practice when i got to that that deep back bend something would pop in my house in my chest it would make this loud popping sound and i would get in my car and i would sob after practice i would just sob and sob and sob and sob and there was nothing ever wrong there was nothing wrong with my chest and i'm again i'm feeling a little bit of pain here today but what i think was happening was something in that on a hatha that heart chakra region was healing itself it was healing itself not just for me but for this time now on a twin flame journey that's that had to be healed And I'm going to show you. That's okay. I don't, I don't have anybody home to watch him. You're so totally he, he's, fine. He's being so good. So, well, I'm going to tell, I sent you this as well, uh, too. And I'm just going to show our viewers one more time another good, good thing to work on uh, to help you work on your bunda action and pulling in in that lower area, which the bundas are just a pulling in. So, like, if you're in practice, you should not be belly breathing right? You should have your stomach contracted and pulled in because that's controlling that energy. The breathing for your asana practice is actually just like you're breathing when you go for a run. It is not ujjayi breathing, guys. Do Stop that nonsense right now. It is, if your teacher tells you to ujjayi breathe in asana practice, do not go back to that class. All right? That is not ujjayi. ujjayi breathing is sitting, a seated pranayama where you're locked in. It's deep breathing that's seated on the floor. You actually can't ujjayi breathe it's impossible to ujjayi breathe in asana practice so the good news is you probably aren't doing it anyway all right it's just free breathing with sound through the nose because the mouth is stressed breathing the nose is a clearer breath um and so when we have our bundas our stomach pulled in that's part of that breathing is keeping that control with the breath and something you can do to help with i know i said this to you emmy is bar i love bar classes i marnie alton i think is fantastic and she does a lot of the pelvic tilts which is what's helping control that lower belly area. You can even take um, like something they do in bar to help get into it is take a ball. This might be a little rude, but that's okay. Stick it in between your legs. Oh, you can't really see anyway. And squeeze the ball in between your legs, right? That's something you guys could see that anyway. But you can stick it in between your legs and just start squeezing the ball in between your legs. That's getting your inner thighs to work which is surprisingly where we carry a lot of anger. So people don't want to work the inner thighs, but it's also connecting into the root of the perineum, which is your mola bunda. That's where you're locking off that energy. And so I will put a link to this down in the description box as well, guys, um, for you guys to start looking at this stuff. But physical exercise, if you're trying to emotionally heal yourself, physical exercise, especially with yoga, is something that's, ne that's necessary in order to continue to, to heal yourself. It's compulsory as my teacher in India says. And, and, and if you're not, into, if yoga is not right, you're not ready for that yet, start taking walks every day. Just start doing something to get that energy moving in the body. You know, it's, it's necessary.
Yeah, another, another thing that's really important about physical movement is our lymph system. You know, our circulatory system, we have the heart, pumps the blood around. We have nothing to pump our lymph. And yeah. we're not taught about the lymph system. Like, it is so important to squeeze those lymph nodes and get it to move. Because if we have stuff built up in our lymph nodes, you know, it can, it can end up cancerous. Yep. And it is just... Walking is excellent. Yoga is excellent. There's another type of exercise that I did that, that moves lymph, but lymph, moving lymph is so incredibly important. And I just wanted to mention that on top of all I'm glad of trauma you did. work. I'm glad you did. And I was telling somebody this the other day. Um, that's why. So we do all these asanas. And at the end of our practice, we do shirshasana. We're supposed to do it for 15 minutes. I only do it for like five to 10 minutes. Um, it's a headstand. And that is because you do, once you, it's a lot of that has to do with the lymphatic system it's draining it once you've boiled it moved it gotten it around and then you start to to drain it and so you're up and then a headstand takes strength to hold it that's me right here uh, with my best friend another friend in india um to drain that lymphatic system now i would tell people like don't you dare don't you dare get a chair or equipment to help you hang upside down that's not why god gave you muscles Right. If you can't, if I, I, I'll do a video soon. I was supposed to do it a few weeks ago. Then I got a fever and I haven't done it yet. Maybe tomorrow morning I'll film a, a headstand video for you guys. But if you can't hold yourself up and do a full headstand yet, don't use the wall to do a headstand. Cause that's going to enable you. It's going to cause some neck issues. If you're not strong enough to lift, lift your legs up yet, that's because your core, it's because your core is strong. Okay. So you got to get your core strong first and then your legs will come up. Okay. So, um, I, I can show, I can do a video on how to, how to handle that if you're not strong enough, but if you're not ready to go up upside down all the way yet, you could just put your, your legs up the wall for 10 minutes. And when I'm on my period, if you're on your period, you're not going to do a headstand anyway, cause it's going to slow down your period. So I just put my legs up the wall for 10 minutes and that's helped draining that lymphatic system. Cause Emmy is completely right. And I'm so glad she brought that up. Cause that is, that is so important for, uh, for the body is to, to, to do stuff, to get the lymphatic system moving as well. So. And that's, and then you get the, that's where I got my nose pierced in India. No gloves. They just stuck it right on through. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my friend was right there to take a picture. <laughs> <laughs> I love India so much. That's why I love India. And uh, there was, a, if I can find the picture, there was a baby. Where's the baby? There was like a newborn baby in the room with me. Right there she is. Right. Well, she was like, hanging out right beside me when I got my nose pierced. So that's, uh -huh. that's this child's heart. That's the first thing she saw in the world was some white girl in there getting her nose pierced. <laughs> <laughs> oh my heavens. Oh, yeah, she's going to have to work through that shit at some point. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, that was that. Yeah. So there was a, there was a weird picture of Obama <laughs> outside of the India hospital. So <laughs> <laughs> um so anyway but uh but yeah that that uh that that's that's india for you but um but yeah guys so i'm i'm hoping and i'm so glad because i mean you text me and said that you were you were feeling such such a feeling the effects of this and i hope that's really helping people i do feel like even though i started my channel as something different from from yoga from what i i do did professionally still do from time to time it, it has become a part of my channel now and i feel like um you know, I've had the opportunity. I, I obviously I don't have children. There's a lot that I haven't had the opportunity, ha haven't had the opportunity to do because of my going back and forth to India. But because I've had the opportunity to go back and forth to India and to learn from some of the top gurus and palm gurus of India, I do feel like I have a responsibility to share the information. And whether someone chooses to take it or not is up to them. But the our, our guide people in, in in the right direction to find the information for themselves. And I would say, you know, Emmy and I are friends off camera, so I can help Emmy. I've been helping Stephanie. But for people watching, I would definitely recommend first of all, try to find your own teacher, someone that can actually physically see you and touch your body and physically that sounded bad but to feel your patterning in your body um and that can actually you can actually be accountable to and then the second thing too is is with teachers too true teachers are not going to be the nicest people in the world sometimes you know a true teacher is going to call you on your shit mm -hmm. and it's going to be tough on you when it's it, they're not going to read you poetry in the room and play any music <laughs> and the reason why they're tough on you is because they know you can do it. And sometimes yeah. they have to be the one to kind of put you in that position to actually show, show you that you can do it. You know, they're not 
mean. They're not abusive, but they're just tough. Uh, because they, they, and they, and they've done it themselves and they continue to do it themselves every day too, to themselves. I have my own teacher. Your teacher should always have a teacher as well. Um, so, so, um, so yes, I would definitely say first and foremost, to everybody watching, find someone to help you in your real life. But also these are some, I will put all the links down in the description box. I'll put a stronger nurses links up. I'll put Marty Alton's links up. Um, I'll put Emmy's links up and I will put any other resources we've talked about in this episode, I will put down in the description box for you guys to help you on your journey. And it's a journey that never ends. So don't feel like, you know, I always, when I, uh, when I finished, I remember when I first finished primary series, I was like, where are all the balloons? Where are the balloons? <laughs> <laughs> no balloons fall from the sky. You just start the second series. When I finished second series, I was like, where are the balloons? <laughs> no, nope, nope. You just start third series. So it's never ending. It's, and you're always going back and relearning. You're always going back and re-exploring. You know, it's, it's a yo-yo. You're, you're ebbing and flowing, ebbing and flowing. Just because I have practiced primary and second series doesn't mean that I don't practice them anymore. I always go back and there's always things to learn. At the, I actually think primary series of Ashtanga Yoga is the best of all the series. It's it's the most grounding. It's the most healthy, in my opinion. It makes the most sense. And so, um, so that's super, super important that people understand that. There is no finish line. There's just no finish line. And so san, you have to practice that Santosha, which is inner contentment, being okay with where you are. And I promise you, I promise you, there are a lot of flexible psychopaths out there. It's not about that. <laughs> okay. It's not about that at all. So um, I've dated a few of them. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't, I don't give a shit if you can put your leg behind your head. That's not impressive to me. Like be a good person. That's what's impressive to me. So, um, so yeah, so, so don't even worry about that guys. And if you're in a yoga studio or yoga shala where you do feel intimidated, where you do feel like there is a pressure to perform, then that's not the right shala for you. Mm, yeah. It's not a race. Mm -mm. It's not a race. Nope. Nope. And if you are struggling in the foundational stuff, then good. Your karma came up early. And again, see those, that, those obstacles as something interesting. That's something that you have to work with. And thank God you have something to work with. Yes. You know, there was, there was one thing, there was a shift in my mindset when I was working through my trauma. And I, I had this feeling of dread towards it. And I read something and I don't know where it was and I don't know who wrote it, but it said to look at your issues with Mom. awe and curiosity. Mom, and so I'm I started so, doing that. Mom, I'm thirsty. Here, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I just started looking at things with curiosity and with awe and it, it's just been so amazing. The, the more stuff that comes up, um, the more I try to tie it to, like today, I was having anxiety. Well, I did a bunch of stuff yesterday, a bunch of hip work, a bunch of walking. Um, I walked around um, an entire lake. We, we go to a, our little watering hole. You can walk around the whole thing. It takes about half an hour. Um, it, and I just, I, I knew and I expected, okay, I did a lot of hip stuff today. I've been working on my back bend. I've been working on, um, you know, protracting my shoulders. Stuff's going to come up. And it did. And I was okay with it. I mean, I had some freaking horrible anxiety this morning. Horrible. Yeah. And I'm just like, okay, it's all right. And I just let it. I just allowed it. And, and when you can take that kind of approach, working through your trauma is not scary at all. Absolutely. Cause you, that's, that's, it's a gift. It's a gift. And I will say too, sometimes that, that uh, to remind people, I've sometimes the practice, the practice isn't designed to give you the answers. Mm -hmm. The practice is designed to show you where there are issues. It's up to you to do the inner work to find the answers. Right. And I will give you guys an example. So when I was deep in a second series many years ago, um, the second series is nerve therapy. There's a lot of really deep, obviously back in there. Something started to happen to me physically where I would start to shake uncontrollably. And I didn't know what was going on. And it was my teacher at the time that said, what's happening to you is the same. He's like, go look at videos of military men and women with PTSD. 
they're shaking just like you are. There's something going on with your, you have a trauma. There's something that's, tr that this practice is triggering in your nervous system that you need to explore. And the only way I could explore that deep trauma was to go into trauma therapy for, and I got diagnosed with complex post-traumatic stress disorder. I found a trauma therapist who is really well-versed in Eastern philosophy. So she worked with me through past life stuff. She worked with me through the unsaid, the, the stuff that's unsaid. And then we did EMDR therapy. Oh, EMDR is amazing. It's amazing. And amazing. we can do a whole video on that. If you guys want to actually really want to do a video on the vagus nerve on, uh, what different trauma uh, and anxiety disorders look like. So Emmy, if, I'd hate to put you on the spot on a, on a video, but if that's something you would want to do coming up. In oh the yeah. Future. I have, I have experience with CP, CPTSD and the shaking. I've yeah. been there on that. <laughs> High five girl, like not a club. I want anybody yeah, to be not, part of, but yeah. <laughs> actually, you know, it's funny though. I always say that like when I'm going through trauma, so doing my practice every day, going to my trauma therapy, do, doing EMDR, rapid eye movement, which we can talk about because that comes into the Tristana method of Ashtanga yoga as well, which we'll get into next time. Um, it, it awarded me and gave me the opportunity to do so much work on myself. I wouldn't be here where I am today sitting on YouTube if I had not gone through that. And so if you look at these issues that you have, and that's the thing about trauma and anxiety, especially as some of us have so are so used to living with trauma and anxiety that we don't even know that's what that is. Mm. Like, I just thought everyone had nightmares every night. I thought that's what I thought everyone had to lock their bedroom door at night because they sleepwalk and they had night terrors. I didn't realize that that's not what other people did. Yeah. I mean, I had, I, I kid you not guys. When I lived in my, my place in Buckhead, there was one right before I moved here, there was one morning I woke up and I had rearranged my whole bedroom. I had taken all the clothes out of my closet, dumped them on the floor. I had moved furniture around. It looked like a freaking poltergeist had been in my room, but I, I, I'm, I'm good with spirits. I know what spirits are. I knew that was, I had done that. I knew I had done that in my sleep. Wow. And I just thought that people, I just thought it was a funny story that people do that. So I didn't realize that that was a sign that there was a trauma because I lived with it for so long that it became normal. And it wasn't until I started to address the issue and started to heal the issue that I was like, oh, there's actual peace that people have that I didn't realize I didn't have. And so that is another thing. And I love you bringing that up, like embracing these things, because that's what the, those, these are, these, this is your body, your sweet bodies, your holy sacred bodies way of saying, Hey, yeah, something's wrong. Hey, we, we need to look at this because it, I need you to pay attention right here. Cause I, I want to be I want to be living in peace with you. So, but let's do that. So I, I'll ask the viewers right now. So if we talk about the vagus nerve next time, EMDR, CPTSD, all that kind of stuff. If there are any other questions or things you want us to bring up in the next video regarding nerve therapy, regarding trauma, just let us know down in the comment section below. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yay. I love it. Yay. We, we can go for a long time, girl. This was so <laughs> fun. And just so you guys know, Stephanie did not join us today because she's got something going on right now. She'll be back on the channel next week. I just wanted to go ahead. She's very, she's, she's very well aware we're on right now. I just wanted to, <laughs> things get a little like, crazy in the YouTube world sometimes. So I just want to put that out there. She has got something going on. I know it's, she'll be back next week guys. So, um, so, so don't worry about that, but all right, Emmy, I'm going to let you go off and be that rock star mama that you are with your seven uh -huh. little babies. And, um, <laughs> And I'm so proud of you, Emmy. I, I can see a glow in your face. And that is one thing that this practice does is you start to see people, the light in people's eyes start to shine even brighter when mm -hmm. they start to embrace this practice. So, Thank and the magic much. of who Thank you are you. as a human. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bryce. I appreciate all, all of your help and advice. It's been, it's been awesome. And you guys go, go, go contact Emmy for Reiki. I've got, like I said, I've got so many people have come message me about how amazing you are, Emmy. And so once again, all of her contact information will be down in the description box below. It's a wonderful way. Reiki, I, I recommend Reiki to people all the time because it's just such an incredible way to start filtering that energy through. And, um, you know, and you can be your own superhero. I mean, that's your, that's your superpower is that you have the ability to heal yourself mm -hmm. and there are modalities out there to help you along the way. So to put that cape on 
and start, <laughs> start getting to it. So, all right, guys. Well, I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend ahead and we will talk to you all very soon. Bye guys. Bye.